I'll, I'll lead with the last question, actually. I'm five minutes under already, so I'll, I'll lead with the last questions where uh, granularity of the microservice. And one thing for certain is that you need a standard interface, and that standard interface is the API, and that's not changing. At least that's stable, regardless of the granularity of this, or the size of the microservice, right? So I'll lead with that into this presentation. By the way, that, that guy's an imposter. I'm much more good looking, right? So. <laughs> uh, so APIs are technologies that can transform your uh, business into a platform. Right? So, so I'll start with that. So we'll really talk about why platforms. Right? So it, it's an old topic, but I'll, I'll explain it from an enterprise API marketplace perspective. Right? So platforms are not just the Ubers and the, the Lyfts of the world, but platforms are also internal creativity engines within your organization itself. Right? So I'll, I'll talk about that fact. Uh, how do you get to platforms? So you start with the standard interface, you start with the problem, and then today that problem is APIs, right? So APIs as your unit of innovation. I'm gonna walk over this way, cool. Yeah, uh, there was a session on API marketplaces. I'm not sure whether you attended that, right? We'll very briefly touch upon that. Uh, we'll basically go on to what challenges the platforms face today, especially the governance challenges, the sustainability challenges, right? We'll go into that. But in essence, this is lessons learned from our 13 or 14 years working with customers, starting from the age-old days of application servers, then uh, the enterprise service bus integrations, moving on to security and identity, then came API management. Today, as Srinath mentioned, you don't know what it's going to be, whether it's going to be serverless, whether it's going to be microservices, we are figure, trying to figure out the granularity, so on and so forth, right? So, but I'll basically talk about our lessons as WSO2 as we moved along uh, that path. Uh, but I'll start with this. So, so Tyler spoke about software is eating the world, Mark Andreessen's quote. Every, tech, every company is a software company, or every company is a technology company, right? It's a, it's a well-known fact. Uh, I just used this graph from uh, visualgraphics.com. So basically, if you look at this, you can see the, the largest brands uh, in the US today and globally today are technology companies, but pure play technology companies, right? So, so the Googles of the world, the ABCs of the world, Apples of the world, so on and so forth, right? Uh, there are some companies here who are typical, like hardware companies, um, telco companies that are moving into software. There are some companies here that are basically hot on heels, right? The traditional telco companies that are moving into software. And we were talking to a few customers today, and, and we have a few customers here, right? So we have a number of organizations, like for example, we have banks who now treat themselves as software companies, but they also happen to do financial services, right? Uh, I was talking to a telco company today who, who treat themselves as a software company who happen to do telco services, right? So the world has moved on from traditional industrial companies who use IT just as a cost center, and then IT as a business advantage to, towards a, a fully software-driven organization who now can focus on their core competencies as well. Right? So that's, that's an important aspect, and we see many organizations moving towards this, which is why we recently changed our tagline as well, right? if, you, if you notice that. So we help digitally-driven organizations become integration agile. Right? So, by digitally driven, what we mean there is you are an organization who has a vision for software. Technology is part of your business strategy. Uh, it's not a different thing where you come up with your business strategy, then you tell your IT team that this is what you need, and you treat it as a cost center. Right? So everything's part and parcel, and the same concept. By the way, technology is supposed to be the biggest driver uh, today. Even if you look at the US stock markets, uh, you see like uh, the Amazons and ABCs at a totally different level compared to like the older companies, uh, the more traditional companies. So technology is kind of like, and software is kind of like the uh, hottest market today. I think there's only two other markets that are on par uh, or have a better forecast than technology. Like one of them is, I think, agriculture. People are thinking agriculture will make a big comeback. The next one is medical marijuana. Right, so, so yeah. <laughs> um, so, so yes, so we've been talking about software, right? But there is another concept. So software alone today is also becoming commodity. Right? So 
So you, you have software out there, you have open source. So sometime back, open source was the perfect strategy to combat uh, commodity software, right? So proprietary software. So you have software that can be shared. You have 100 eyes looking at the software. You have contributions from the outside world. So that was a good strategy. But then today, software is a commodity, right? So the, you need value additions on top of the software. You need to be able to release faster. You need to be able to provide the, the world-class support that, uh, that is required, which WSO2 does, by the way. Uh, you, you need to be able to re release at a lower cost, cost much faster, so the whole microservices, the agile technologies come into play. But you also need to be able to get community participation. Uh, so the, that means participation from, from your, your users, from your stakeholders, from your partners, but from the whole organization as well. Right? So when, when I started IT some time back, uh, which is not too long back, by the way, I'm not that old. right? So, but when I started IT some time back, you had a, a tech lead. So they, you'll have the business who comes up. They give you your set of requirements. Someone puts it down into a software requirement specification. It was called a DSRS, a detailed software requirement specification, right? which was 500,000 pages large. That is given to a tech lead. He draws out class diagrams, sequence diagrams. That's given to an engineer. They start implement it, implementing it. You have the interfaces, uh, all of that. right? Uh, so, so, so basically, we moved on from there, where you now have agile teams, but you also need to be able to get the whole organization to be able to contribute to the creativity of the organization. Right? So, so that's where APIs come into play. Right? Everyone knows APIs, but it's becoming more and more important in the microservices world, because APIs are, if you think about it, they are the encapsulation of your IP right, within your organization. So, if you as an organization, let's say you are a telco organization, right? so you have your data, which is really, really rich, which was very proprietary in the past. So that's your assets. That's your technology assets. So your first mindset change is to basically be able to expose those technology assets to the outside world so that the outside world can also contribute towards your business. So they can basically build a business around you. And at the same time, you would gain some revenue as well. Right? So that's the external. API use case, and I'll, I'll talk about one of those use cases in detail. But internally as well, right? you expose your technology assets. Let's say you have a, a mainframe within a financial organization. You wrap this mainframe as an API, and you now allow developers who are not like core mainframe experts, uh, give them the ability to basically build smaller services, small applications around that, and let them participate in the ecosystem as well. So something that was like privileged to just a few mainframe developers now becomes accessible to the rest of the organization. So similar to what you'd expect with the external stakeholders, you should be able to expect the same with internal stakeholders as well. So that's the concept of basically being able to get collaboration and crowdsourcing within the organization. So you build a marketplace within the organization as well. So there are different reasons for building APIs, right? Again, we'll not go into too much details here. I've just picked one of the graphs from uh, Wipro, and uh, if you can see that, say, let's say 70% of the reasons for building an API is to exploit new businesses, uh, new channels, so on and so forth, right? So, but if you look at it from a high-level perspective, it's like two or three reasons. You, you streamline your internal assets, so that means you basically expose your assets as standard APIs, uh, you want to build a centralized catalog so everyone can come and discover your services, your APIs, your microservices. You want to be able to wrap your mainframe systems that was not accessible in the past so that you can start building new applications around this. Uh, or better or newer customer reach, right? so newer business models. Uh, so we have few organizations who started as internal assets only. You build your portals so that they can access these internal assets. So that's your first step. So you standardize your services, and your portals are used to access those APIs. Two years down the line, you then realize you have these APIs. You can expose a few APIs externally and monetize just a few of them. Right? So, uh, uh, so we have Bank of New York Mellon, who is, uh, who is in this room as well. Right? So very good use case of how to build an inter internal enterprise API marketplace, uh, how to basically expose those APIs externally, how to monetize that, uh, et cetera, as well. Ch compliance is becoming a key requirement as well, especially in the European market. Uh, you have the PSD2 compliance, 
uh, you have the GDPR compliance, which makes sense if you expose everything through a centralized API gateway. Right? So, so compliance is also becoming a key drive, driver for API management, for the better or the worse. And, and we are seeing a huge uptake of uh, compliance-driven APIs in the European market. And that's, uh, that's moving on to the Australian market and the Latin American market as well. So APIs are the core. Right? So you start with APIs, but the next step is platforms. So, so we spoke about software eating the world and uh, every company is a technology company. But to be truly successful, you need to be sustainable. And to be too, truly sustainable, you basically need to be able to get the network effect. And you need to be able to get the collaboration of producers as well as consumers. So let me break that down. So uh, let's say you have an organization that builds APIs. Right? So, so we had such a case study in the past where we had a organization, you had the enterprise architecture group of the organization who decided that you needed an API management platform. So they went ahead, built the platform. Uh, they basically published a few APIs themselves. They had a few applications on the platform. But then they, they didn't go the next step, and they didn't basically ensure that the rest of the organization understood why they need to publish APIs and why they needed to consume APIs. Right? So, so you have this mega monolith platform in the middle, you have like certain services going through that, but then other organizations realize it's much more easier to just circumvent the platform and go around it. Right? So then you have more and more organizations just going around the platform, and that doesn't solve, solve the purpose. Right? So eventually that platform had to be uh, decommissioned. Right? So, so it's important that when building API platforms, you start from the grassroots level, and you basically focus on advocacy as well. So advocacy, hackathons, workshops, on why people need to publish APIs, why people need to consume APIs, is very important. Right? And that basically leads to the network effect. So if you look at this chart, it's an interesting chart. Uh, it's basically how long each industry took to reach 50 million. So if you look at like an example like the automobile industry from around 1960s, uh, 62 years to reach 50 million. Right? So Facebook took three years to reach 50 million. Uh, Pokemon Go took 19 days to reach 50 million, right? So, and, and compared to automobiles, I don't know what Pokemon Go provides. So, but but that's, that's the case. So, so you'll, have, you'll have scenarios where you reach like 50 million in a couple of hours in the future, right? So when, when platforms are launched. So again, this is like large scale, large internet scale. So this is not what we are, we are really talking about. But you can take this, create a really scaled down version for the enterprise. And that's where the enterprise starts becoming sustainable. So if you go with an enterprise API management platform, you need to make sure that the platform adoption is there. So that, that is key. So even though we talk about technology today, technology adoption, platform adoption, and, and basically uh, the, the sustainability of these technologies is quite key. That's one of the reasons why microservices is gaining uh, adoption as well, because you can expect, like if you looked at Asanka's talk, uh, you have the concept of cells. You can really expect any technology to live within that cell. Right? So developers use whatever technology they want. You expose a standard API. And from there onwards, you basically uh, build your enterprise from, uh, from grassroots level onwards. Right? So, so instead of going with that monolith application, you have the ability to uh, make a sustainable platform. Uh, again, number of examples of successful platforms. Right? So, if you look at the traditional businesses like Marriott and, and the taxi companies, right? So being replaced with uh, Airbnb and, and Uber, respectively. Right? But one of the um, major things there is, let me go to this. So one of the major aspects there is that the producers, if you take Uber as an example, right? You have the drivers who are the producers of service. You have the consumers who are the riders, right? And that needs to work in unison, right? So for example, this. If you've seen this diagram, this is uh, basically uh, the investor pitch that Uber did for the very first time, right? David Yammer's diagram. Uh, so, so basically, he was part of Yahoo as well. Uh, so this, this, this is drawn on a napkin. But basically, what this says is like, if, if there are more drivers, right? so the, the, the supply goes up. Right? So then Uber has to reduce the prices, provide discounts, so the more riders come on board. And if there's more riders, then the uh, demand goes up, supply goes down, then you have to basically increase the prices, so you have peak prices. 
So it's, it's an it's a ever-evolving cycle. When you take this to API management, basically, you need to balance out producers of APIs, publishers of APIs, and the consumers of APIs. You need to make sure that the good APIs are available, the right APIs are available, uh, the right applications are available to consume these APIs, the right feedback loop is given back. Right? So if you noticed on the API manager, like we focus on the, the really cool stuff. Right? But uh, if you go into the developer portal, you have the forum on the API manager where cons consumers, the, the consumers of the API can provide feedback. Right? Uh, you have another feature where when you're publishing an API, uh, you can split it up into like the designers and the publishers. So someone can design the API, someone else can publish the API. And you have the ability of uh, publishing prototypes. So you publish multiple prototypes and get feedback from the subscribers or from the consumers. Right? So when you, even within an internal organization where you don't have control of what kind of APIs will be published and what kind of APIs will be consumed, this, this is a key capability right? So in, in ensuring uh, an, an enterprise API marketplace. Uh, quick uh, use case there. So uh, this is a telco, uh, Dialog Asiata, uh, basically part of the Asiata group in, uh, based out of Malaysia. So, so their head office is in Malaysia, and, and they basically have seven subsidiaries. Right? So, uh, so I use this use case often, so I'll, I'll repeat it again. Hopefully no one has heard this before. Uh, typical telco, right? So back in the day, like uh, eight, six, uh, seven, eight years ago, Telco started facing a lot of competition from over the air technologies like Skype and Twilio majorly, right? So Skype for voice and Twilio for SMS and, and different uh, like services, location-based services, right? So, but Telcos were giant corporations. They were not agile. They didn't have the ability to basically compete with these newer technology providers. So, so what Dialog did is, uh, Dialog basically decided to do an internal digital transformation first. Like this is the telco, largest telco based out of Sri Lanka, serving around 20 million subscribers. Uh, so the way they did that was they started with the ESB, and they basically uh, started a project which take, took like uh, one and a half years to transform all of their internal services uh, into the, via the ESB, right? And they put an API manager in front of that, and they ended up with 500 APIs internally, right? It's a large number of APIs, but it was a start. Right? So they didn't go to refactor anything. You just create everything as APIs so that the internal teams can discover the APIs, uh, they can figure out what services are already there, what needs to be built. So Dialog, I think, had around 20 different uh, IT teams, so you had now a way of uh, cross-using services across IT teams. Uh, once that was available, uh, that layer was there, so the management could see what was there and what wasn't there. Then management made a decision that you need to, to monetize these APIs. So the, since the 500 APIs was there already, or the APIs were there, they created a secondary API management layer, again based on WSO2, where they exposed around seven APIs to the external world. So they started with, with a SMS API, a, a direct operator billing API, a location-based services API, all of which just connected back to the dialogue backend. Right? And these APIs were exposed, and they could then monetize those APIs. So they had apl uh, applications basically consuming those APIs and building certain applications around it. Right? Uh, but they went st one step further, and they organized hackathons, workshops, with like all of the universities in Sri Lanka and the Asia Pacific region. And they also went ahead and set up a venture capital fund for applications that, uh, like any mobile applications that are built, consuming those APIs. So it was a very successful program, uh, and, and that they had a separate team for evangelism, so on and so forth. There was like, Quite a few interesting use cases out of that as well. Uh, there was a, a MFish application, I think, uh, uh, an initiative of John Kerry and Leonardo DiCaprio, where, uh, like, when you do fishing in any of the uh, oceans around the Asia Pacific region, right, the Indian Ocean, so on and so forth, you can look at the prices of the, the fish in the markets so that you know what kind of fish to catch and what kind of fish to uh, leave, put back in the water, right? So, sustainable fishing. Uh, that worked well because they had the same API management infrastructure in seven countries across uh, all of the Dialog Asiata groups. So it is a federated API management infrastructure. So for some reason, let's say you use API management in Sri Lanka. Now you flew to Malaysia for some reason, like not while fishing, but normal use case, right? 
you flew to Malaysia, then it switches to the Malaysian API gateway, and that just federates to the Sri Lankan API gateway. Right? So, so once you start exposing as APIs, you can basically do like federation of APIs as well. OK, so there's a number of things that we spoke about. But just to summarize some of those things, an organization needs to start with a, your, your organizational strategy. API strategy should be part and parcel of that organizational strategy. And, and technology strategy also should be part and parcel of your organizational strategy. Right? So that's, that's quite important. Uh, but one of the things we, we, we don't focus on, even with most of the projects that we work on, is this whole facilitating the consumers and uh, empowering the producers part. So if you take something as simple as API management, doing those workshops, doing those uh, productivity sessions for application developers to ensure that they are on board as well, that they build the right applications is, is quite useful. It's quite important in order to ensure that the platform is sustainable. Right? Similarly, workshops to ensure the right APIs are produced. Right? So all of that boils down to what is called incentives here at the bottom. Incentives can be anything. Right? So, we have certain organizations which uh, tie your publishing of services to your performance appraisals. Right? So, so basically, you publish more services. Uh, your services or APIs are used by majority of applications in the organization. Then you, you move up in a leaderboard, which is published every week. And that is associated with performance as well. Right? So even, even within WSO2, right, we have a system where we look at the, the build performance of all of our products. And that actually goes into the performance appraisals, right? so for the better or worse. Right? Uh, so, but incentives can be many forms. It's the simple leaderboards of what are the top APIs, uh, which, which are all, uh, all of these analytics are given out of the API analytics platform. Uh, and there are certain gamifications, right? So, so basically, you say uh, this, this API has consumed the most, this user has the most number of useful APIs, so on and so forth. Monetization and analytics is quite important as well. Again, monetization can, be, can take different forms. Like if you are a business unit, you can track who from other business units are consuming your APIs. So you can track cross-business unit access or cross-business unit uh, revenue management. Right? So uh, when you're ready to expose your APIs to the external world, that can also result in some kind of uh, monetization strategy there. But then with platforms come the governance problem, right? So uh, recent, especially with recent issues like the Facebook issues and privacy issues and so on and so forth. So again, so we've been talking about disaggregated architectures and distributed systems. But one of the things is we are moving away from the central, centralized team, from siloed teams, from center of excellence to very decentralized teams, right? But then governance remains a key issue, a key challenge. So which is why we are working on many uh, solutions like the observability framework. Uh, so if you, if you go into some of the sessions, we are talking about observability, where you can have certain policies. Uh, you have the ability to, let's say, distributedly publish your APIs or services or microservices. Those have to adhere to certain policies. And then using observability, you can figure out which services are adhering to those policies and which aren't, right? but in a distributed manner. So, Going towards microservices, you are moving away from this central siloed systems, but then you cannot lose certain uh, important organizational concepts such as governance, right? So, so, that, so we have to find better solutions for that. And, and as WSO2, we are also working on, on this area as well. So, so what that means is you basically need the right technology to build platforms at the end of the day. These can be external platforms. These can be external business platforms. Or you can start small, and you have to focus on your internal enterprise API platform or enterprise business platform as well. So as WSO2, we've been there on that journey. We've worked with customers from, from the days of application servers to the days of serverless platforms. So, so we have the right technology. like We have the API management platform. We have the identity access management platform that can be brought in when required to do like federated identity. Uh, we have the integration platform, and we have technologies like Ballerina to do your integration, so on and so forth. And along with that, uh, if you listen to the, the, the keynote as well, and then Asanka's uh, sessions as well, we have the right methodology, the, the reference architectures to get you there and to make you integration agile. Right? So that's, that's it from me, hopefully in 25 minutes, no? OK, so. <laughs>
so basically, to summarize, uh, so as, in, as enterprises, we have to really focus on sustainable solutions within the organization. Top-down approaches where you just decide on the technology, just push it in, and expect everyone to use it uh, is not the best solution. But at the same time, letting everything trickle up from below is also maybe not the best solution. So you have to find the right balance. So whatever solution you go with, and even if you start with API management, it has to be a sustainable solution. And like platforms are the best option of doing that.